We're going to discuss memory in the context of the three storage model of memory. And this model of memory is not being presented because it's necessarily accurate or everyone accepts it. It is a hugely popular model of memory though and it's been presented in general psychology courses for decades. It has generated a great deal of research. It's affected the language that we use to discuss memory processes. But it's not necessarily the only model of memory or the a perfect model of memory. But I do want you to know it. And part of what we'll talk about later with memory involves memory aids. And so the diagram that I'm showing you is a sort of memory aid because if you can cl close your book and draw this diagram and label all the different processes, replicate it, then you've got a good start on your studying. So let's begin. Three storage model of memory. Obviously there are three types of memory processes. Sensory memory, short-term memory or STM, and long-term memory or LTM. So according to this model there are some sort of environmental events, stimuli that occur. That information enters sensory memory and we may selectively attend to that information. If so, it enters short-term memory. And we may consolidate that short-term memory as long-term memory. And later on, perhaps, retrieve that information from long-term memory by bringing it back into short-term or working memory. So that's the basic series of processes. I want you to also know the characteristics of each of these three types of memories. Specifically, I want you to know the duration of each type and the capacity of each type of memory. And by duration, I mean how long can that memory last? How long can it be stored in the terms of that memory process? By capacity, I mean how much information can be stored in terms of a specific type of memory. So sensory memory has a duration of less than a second and we really don't know the limits of the capacity of sensory memory. That's something we'll discuss a little bit later. Short-term memory has a duration of less than 30 seconds unless of course we engage in maintenance rehearsal, repeating something to ourselves over and over. But without that type of maintenance rehearsal, typically information stays in short-term memory less than 30 seconds. Its capacity is often referred to as the magic number 7 plus or minus 2 chunks. Long-term memory, let's talk about its duration is infinite. We don't know how long long-term memory would last if our lives were infinite. And let's talk about capacity of long-term memory is infinite as well because we really don't know the limits of how much information can be stored as long-term memory. There is evidence for the three storage model of memory and I want you to be familiar with three pieces of evidence. First, anterior grade amnesia. Anterior grade amnesia occurs when there has been damage to the hippocampus in both hemispheres. Um, there are times when brain surgery takes place. Uh, it involves a bilateral, both sides, bilateral hippocampectomy, um, damage to the hippocampus in both hemispheres of the brain. And the result is anterior grade amnesia. And there are several individuals who've undergone this type of brain surgery and they have come to be known by their initials. For instance, HM and another individual known as NA. But the type of memory deficit that occurs with anterior grade amnesia is very interesting. If you talk to a person who's undergone a bilateral hippocampectomy, then they seem fairly normal. They can carry on a conversation, although their slang use might be a little bit out of date. But if you leave the room and come back later, then that individual will not remember having talked to you. They will not remember you. So it's almost as if every day is a fresh new day for someone who experiences this. Now, researchers have studied individuals who have undergone 
bilateral hippocampectomies and experienced anterior grade amnesia. And it's not every type of memory that's lost. Some types of memories do consolidate as long-term memory. For instance, if you give someone like HM a puzzle to work, and the puzzle that researchers have used, for instance, is the Tower of Hanoi, where there are three upright sticks and some donut rings of different sizes, and according to certain rules, you have to move the donut rings from one of these little upright sticks to another. Anyway, a puzzle. When HM is given the puzzle, he says he's never seen it before, um, even though he may have worked it previously. But every day that he works the puzzle, he gets faster and faster. So it appears that procedural memories, memories of how to do things, can be consolidated as long-term memory, but HM is not going to actually remember his experiences with the puzzles. This is evidence for the three storage model of memory, at least a portion of it, because it suggests that short-term memory is separate and distinct from long-term memory. Retrograde amnesia also provides some evidence for the three storage model of memory. Retrograde amnesia occurs typically when there's a blow to the head. Maybe the person is momentarily unconscious. But when they come to, they do not remember what occurred before the accident. But those memories, most of them will come back beginning with the memories farthest back in time until there's this little window of time right before the accident where the individual will never remember what occurred. So that too suggests that there's evidence for the three storage model of memory and specifically that short-term memory and long-term memory are two separate and distinct processes. Finally, the serial position curve provides evidence for the three storage model of memory, or at least a portion of it. In class, I usually do a demonstration where everybody participates in a demonstration of a serial position curve. Uh, it may not work quite as well with this method of teaching, but we'll give it a try. I'm going to read you a list of words, and I want you to listen to them very carefully and try to remember as many of the words as possible. When I finish, I'm going to say the word go very quietly, and I want you to write down as many of the words as you can remember. Here we go. Bird. House. Tree. Banana. Comb. Store. Telephone. Box. Comet. Carpet. Tornado. Biscuit. Picture bookcase, lampshade, go. So this is the serial position curve. We're looking at the percentage of people who recalled each word, and that is shown on the vertical axis. And then along the horizontal axis, you have the position of the word in the list. Now I'm going to read the list of words again in the same order as I did last time. And I want you to notice which words you remember and which words you tended to forget. First word was bird, and usually a lot of people remember the first word in the list. The second was house, see if you remembered it. Tree, banana, comb, store, telephone, box, comet, carpet, tornado, biscuit, picture, bookcase, lampshade. So if you're like most other people, you remember the first words in the list, those in word position one, two, three, perhaps, and you also remember the words at the end of the list. There were 15 words in the list, and so you probably remember the last few. And what do you forget? You forget the words in the middle of the list. So. This is a very powerful class demonstration. It works pretty much every single time. And what I want you to think about is if you go to the store and you forget your shopping list, well, which items are you going to remember and which ones are you going to forget? Now, the serial position curve is uh, evidence for at least a portion of the three storage model of memory. And the idea is that you remember the words at the beginning of the list because they have been consolidated as long-term memories and that 
we refer to as the primacy effect. So again, we remember the words at the beginning of the list because they probably have been consolidated as long-term memory, and that's the primacy effect. Primacy meaning first. We also have a recency effect. Those are the most recent words on the list, the last words on the list. And the idea is that at the time of recall, those words at the end of the list are still being stored as short-term memory. And we refer to that as the recency effect. So once again, this evidence suggests that short-term memory is a separate and distinct process from long-term memory, which supports that portion of the model. Now let's talk about the three storage model of memory in detail, beginning with sensory memory. And as you recall, I said that sensory memory has a duration of less than a second and a capacity that may be unlimited. We're not sure. And what I want you to know is that when we speak of visual sensory memory, we refer to it as iconic memory. And when we speak of auditory sensory memory or hearing, we refer to it as echoic memory. Just to make it feel more real for you, I want you to think about what would happen if I presented an image of a barn in the countryside on a screen in the classroom and then removed it. It was only momentarily available for you to see. That information is stored briefly as iconic sensory memory. And there's a moment after the image has been removed where you still almost see it and perhaps could answer some questions about it. With regard to echoic sensory memory, auditory memory, as I'm talking, you are hearing what I'm saying. That information, according to the three storage model of memory, is entering your echoic sensory memory. And there's a moment after I say something where that information is still available to you and you can take notes while I'm speaking, but that information is only briefly available to you in echoic sensory memory. An important vocabulary term associated with echoic sensory memory is the cocktail party phenomenon. And this is something that I'm sure you've experienced. It doesn't have to be at cocktail parties. It can be at any group gathering. You may have noticed that when you stand in a room and there are quite a few people in the same room and they're all involved in different conversations, you can typically only pay attention to one conversation at a time and follow it and understand it. You may follow a conversation that's taking place quite near you, people standing nearby, or you may follow a conversation that's occurring across the room. But you really can only focus on one conversation at a time. This is the cocktail party phenomenon. And it gives us a little information about how echoic sensory memory works. Now, the cocktail party phenomenon and echoic sensory memory have been studied in laboratory situations under more controlled circumstances. And one technique that has been used is the dichotic listening task. So if you were to be a participant in research involving the dichotic listening task, then you would wear headphones. And in one ear, through the headphones, you would hear somebody speaking. Maybe they're reading some prose. In the other ear, you'll hear somebody speaking differently, different prose. And you would be asked to follow either your left ear or your right ear specifically to shadow one the information coming into one ear or the other. And by that I mean that you're repeating back everything you heard in that one ear. If you do that, and you can do that, you'll lose all the information for the most part coming into the opposite unshadowed ear. You really can only focus on information coming into one ear through the headphones. However, and this I find fascinating, you will automatically shift your attention from one ear to the other if somewhere embedded in that stream of sounds in the unshadowed ear you hear your name. So that means that there's some processing going on at some level. You're listening to 
information coming in, for instance, into your right ear, you're shadowing it. You're repeating everything that's said into it. And if I ask you questions about what's being said into your other ear, you won't be able to answer any questions about the content. But if somewhere in that stream of sound, your name is said, then your attention automatically turns to that ear. I think that's very cool. The other thing that you might um, detect with respect to the unshadowed ear is the gender of the speaker. You know, even though you're following everything coming into your right ear, you would be able to afterwards to say whether or not the speaker in the left ear was male or female, even if you cannot repeat or remember the content of information presented to that ear. Researchers have also studied iconic sensory memory. And as you may recall, earlier I indicated that we do not know the capacity of sensory memory, that we're not sure how much information can be held in sensory memory. And this is the classic research study that demonstrated that. Before this research was conducted, psychologists believed that sensory memory had a very limited capacity but an individual came along and showed that that was not the case. It's a very elegant experiment, and some students become a little confused at first, but if you listen carefully, this should make sense. Participants were asked to look at a screen, and on the screen were presented arrays of letters. And here you see an example. You're seeing the top row is K-W-E-R, there's a middle row below that, and a bottom row beneath it. These arrays of letters were presented very briefly to participants, and then they were asked to recall as many letters as possible. And when participants were asked to report about the entire array of letters, they only remembered four to five letters. As you can see, this array has 12 letters, and only four or five letters tended to be recalled. However, if participants were shown an array of letters and they were asked to remember only part of the entire array, then the results were very different. So here participants are seeing arrays of letters presented very briefly on a screen and then removed, and they only have to report the top row or the middle row or the bottom row. And in order to prevent interference, they were cued to present the top row by a high pitch sound, the middle row by a medium pitch sound, and the bottom row by a low pitch sound. They don't know in advance which row they're going to have to report. So if I'm a participant in this portion of the study, I'm presented with this array of letters, I hear a tone, maybe it's a medium pitch tone, and that cues me to report the middle row of letters, and I can do that. Or if I heard the high pitched tone, I would report the top row of letters, and I would be able to do that. So basically, this partial report procedure, where you're only presenting one row, not the entire array, people tend to remember all the letters. It didn't matter which row was indicated. They could remember any of the rows. This suggests that sensory memory is not limited in terms of its capacity, and we really have not determined the limits of sensory memory in terms of its capacity. So now let's talk about the second type of memory process in the three storage model of memory, short-term memory. I said that short-term memory can be remembered for about 30 seconds without maintenance rehearsal, and that the capacity of short-term memory is the magic number seven plus or minus two chunks. Now, first I want you to think about telephone numbers. Before area codes, telephone company hired psychologists, and these were experts on memory processing, and if you think about how many digits there are in a telephone number, then you would not be surprised. There are seven digits in a telephone number. That's well within the capacity of our short-term memory. Nowadays, our telephone numbers are all stored on our cell phones, 
But in the past, um, you would have to look up a phone number in a telephone book and remember it long enough to dial it. And having a seven-digit telephone number meant that we were able to do this because it was well within the capacity of short-term memory. So what is 7 plus or minus 2? 7 minus 2 is 5. 7 plus 2 is 9. So 5 to 9 is the capacity of short-term memory. So looking at the slide, I want you to take a look at that series of numbers beginning 1, 7. And think to yourself about whether that number, that long number, is within the capacity of short-term memory. I think the obvious answer would be that no, it's not, because it's well past 7 plus or minus 2 chunks of information. However, you could engage in a psychological process called chunking. And that means that you are reorganizing the information to make it a smaller amount of information that would be within the capacity of short-term memory. So if you notice those first four digits, if I told you they were a date, it would be a date that's very familiar to you, I hope. 1776. The next four digits are another date, 1492. The next series of numbers, 10, 31, 20, 20, is Halloween this year. And 12, 25, 20, 21 is Christmas next year. So now you could cover the screen with your hand and recite this series of numbers to me. In fact, I don't know why they do it, but I've had students come up to me years later on the quad and recite the numbers for their class. Um, not necessary, but I do want you to know about the process called chunking, which breaks down lo large amounts of information so that it can be stored as short-term memory. Last but not least, we need to talk about long-term memory. And this actually might help your studying. I want you to think about the difference between elaborative rehearsal and maintenance rehearsal. I mentioned looking up a phone number and then saying it to yourself over and over and over again in order to remember it long enough to dial. Um, that's maintenance rehearsal. And I want you to think about what would happen if you use maintenance rehearsal to study for a test? Basically, you're opening up your notebook, you're reading information to yourself over and over again. Are you going to remember it at the time of the test? Are you going to consolidate that information as long-term memory? Probably not. That is not a good study technique. Instead, I encourage you to use elaborative rehearsal, which is not unlike what we did with chunking a moment ago. With elaborative rehearsal, you're taking new information that you want to remember. You're reorganizing it. And you are associating that new information with old information that you know very well. Some people study with highlighters where they go through a book or their lecture notes and they highlight the most important information that they want to remember. But the act of highlighting alone is not likely to consolidate that information into long-term memory or help you perform well on a quiz. You really do need to reorganize that information, put it into your own words, elaborate on it, associate new information with old information that's well known to you. Now I want to introduce you to important information about long-term memory and how it functions as well as how research has been conducted on long-term memory. So let me introduce you to an important vocabulary term, state-dependent memory. State-dependent memory involves the idea that our physiological state at the time an incident occurs can serve as a memory cue for trying to remember the details of that incident. So basically, my physiological state at the time I experience something is a memory cue for being able to remember that information later. Put simply, if I'm hungry when I'm studying, I should be hungry again when I'm taking a test. And not the best illustration that I should use, but if one is inebriated at the time one loses one's keys, then according to state-dependent memory research, we should be inebriated again as we're trying to remember where we put our keys. Not recommended. But 
my favorite research study on state dependent memory has to do with scuba diving and researchers asked people to either scuba dive and memorize a list of words underwater or be up on dry land and memorize a list of words. And what the researchers found was that when participants were asked to recall the words on the list, those that learned it while scuba diving underwater remembered the words best when they were again scuba diving underwater. When participants learned the list of words while standing on dry land, that's where they remembered the words best later. So state dependent memory, based on the idea that our physiological state or even the cues around us can serve as retrieval cues when we're trying to retrieve long-term memories. Think about this. According to state-dependent memory research, where should you study for a test? If you want to take full advantage of retrieval cues, then you study in the room where you're actually going to take the test. Next, I want to show you an example of some research regarding long-term memory. Not necessarily a classic study, but an interesting one. And if you find that you like this information about memory, then I want to encourage you to take a cognitive psychology course later on. But again, this is an example of research regarding retrieval cues and long-term memory. Participants were asked to sit at a computer and they were shown sentences with blanks in the sentences. I have two on the board. The blank is on the table and the old man hobbled across the room and picked up the valuable blank. So one of these sentences with a blank in it would appear on the screen and then participants would be shown a word and they would have to indicate yes or no whether or not that word fit in the blank of that sentence. So it might be they were presented with the blank is on the table and they would be presented with the word vase and they would say indicate yes that word fits into the blank or if the word was elephant they would indicate no that word does not fit into the blank. And some of these sentences with the blanks in them were fairly short and others of them were longer. And what the researchers found was at the end of the experiment, when participants were given a surprise recall test, where they were asked to remember all the words that had been presented as possibilities for those blanks in the sentences, that more of those words were remembered when they were associated with the longer sentences. The old man hobbled across the room and picked up the valuable blank. That longer sentence has more retrieval cues than the shorter sentence. And so more of the words paired with those longer sentences with more information in them were recalled. Again, this shows you how psychologists and scientists have studied memory processes. And again, if you like this type of topic, then I want you to take a cognitive psychology course. It's a lot of fun. So now let's talk about forgetting. It should make sense that decay can occur, memory decay, at least theoretically, sensory memory might decay or short-term memory might decay or long-term memories might decay, resulting in forgetting. In fact, if something goes wrong anywhere within that three storage model of memory diagram that I showed you, then forgetting will obviously occur. There can also be interference with memory something that occurs before an event could cause you to forget the event or something that occurs after the event could cause you to forget the event and the two terms associated with these circumstances are proactive interference and retroactive interference let's take proactive interference first and i've put the cue peanut butter next to that not because it has anything to do with your vocabulary list but because it cues me to remember what I want to tell you about proactive interference. With proactive interference, something that occurs beforehand can cause you to forget or have trouble remembering information later. And the best illustration I know actually comes from my childhood. Uh, youngest child here, 
And so when we played school, I was always the student in the classroom, and I had an older sister who was always, always, always the teacher. And unfortunately, this particular sister taught me everything wrong. She taught me some very strange things that have turned out to be problems later on. But one thing that she taught me was a uh, rhyme. And it has to do with being able to remember the number of days in each month. Here's what my older sister taught me when I was very, very young. 30 days, half September, April, June, and no wonder all the rest have peanut butter. Now, I'm sure many of you know the actual rhyme that helps you remember how many days in each month, but frankly, having been taught that rhyme, that incorrect rhyme, at a young age, I was unable to ever remember the rhyme correctly. And so I had to find other ways to remember how many days there are in each month of the year. Uh, pretty irritating. So that's proactive interference. Something she taught me before interfered with my trying to learn something later. If you're trying to study for two tests in one night, it may be that you'll study for your first test and then you'll have trouble trying to remember information for the second test. That too would be proactive interference. Contrast that with retroactive interference. This is displacement, where, for instance, you study information for one test, and then you study information for a second test. And now that you've studied the information for the second test, you can't remember anything you studied for the first test. Something that occurs afterwards affects your memory of what occurred earlier. Finally, there are situations where, for whatever reason, you suddenly cannot remember otherwise well-known information. So I might be having a conversation with someone and I can't remember the name of somebody who I know really well and I've said their name many, many times. Or I'm having trouble remembering the name of a very familiar book or TV show. What do you do when that happens to you? What I do is I'll point to my mouth and I'll say, it's on the tip of my tongue. And this is a real vocabulary term. You must know this. The tip of the tongue phenomenon occurs when very familiar information, just for a moment at least, cannot be recalled. And what do you do in order to overcome the tip of the tongue phenomenon? Basically, just wait a little while and that information will pop right back into your head. That's the way it usually works. And by the way, I have an Irish wolfhound and she's in the room with me. And so if you're hearing loud sounds of movement or other types of background noise, that would be her. She doesn't understand exactly what I'm doing or that she should stay quiet for a while at least. I said that we would be talking about memory aids and so let's do it. Memory aids are also referred to as mnemonic devices and it's pronounced mnemonic. The first M is silent and there are many types of mnemonic devices or memory aids. You can read in your textbook about them, but I really just wanted to cover two that are very useful. The first is the acronym method. If you need to remember a list of words, then the acronym method can help you do this. You basically take the first letter of each word on the list and you come up with another word starting with the same letter, string it together in a sentence that you'll remember easily. So here's something my mother taught me when I was young. It was useful. In order to remember the names of the planets, beginning with the planet closest to the sun, she taught me to remember my very elderly mother just sold Uncle Nick's puppy. So the first letter M is for Mercury, and then V is Venus, E is Earth, and so on. Of course, at that time, there were no questions about whether Pluto was a planet. But as you can see, the acronym method is a very useful mnemonic device. And if you think about what you're doing here, you are reorganizing the material, you're elaborating on it, and you are not just engaging in maintenance rehearsals, saying the information you want to remember over and over. You are associating the information that you want to remember with other information that's very easy for you to remember. The next mnemonic device that I want to describe is the method of loci. 
And when you take those first three letters of loci, it gives you a cue about what this method involves. Think of the word location. Here, you're taking well-known, very familiar information, specifically locations in your home, for instance, and you're associating those with the new information that you're trying to remember. So if you were trying to remember information from our learning theory topic, you might imagine yourself walking into your living room, and there's a man standing there. It's Ivan Pavlov. And guess what kind of animal he has next to him? It's a dog. And the Haney, excuse me. Shh. And what is that dog doing? It's salivating on your rug. Next, you walk into your kitchen, and John B. Watson is in there, along with a child, little Albert. And John B. Watson is holding out a white rat to little Albert and somebody standing behind little Albert and banging pots and pans together to make scary noise. And that makes you think about generalization. Then imagine going into your bedroom and there's a man standing on your bed. It's B.F. Skinner and he's holding a pigeon in one hand and an operant chamber in the other hand. And that helps you recall operant conditioning and SRS, the three-term contingency. Last but not least, you walk into your bathroom and there is Wolfgang Curler and a chimpanzee. And guess what's dangling from a string from the ceiling in your bathroom? A banana. And so you can imagine the chimpanzee trying to get the banana from the ceiling, can't reach it, and then piling up boxes in order to do so. So the method of loci, again, is helping you reorganize information, elaborate on it, and associate new information with old familiar information so that you can remember it more easily. So my hope is that you engage in elaborative rehearsal from now on if you're not doing so already. And it'll certainly help you do better in my course. So here's the three storage model of memory again. And I want to remind you that if you can draw this diagram, label its parts, and label the processes, identify the duration and capacity of each type of memory, it's a good start and a good framework for being able to remember the information that you need to for this quiz. And again, if something goes wrong in any part of this three storage model, presuming you accept it as a model of memory, for instance, something goes wrong in terms of decay of sensory memory, or our selective attention is interrupted, or there's decay of short-term memory, or consolidation is interrupted, or there's decay of long-term memory, or disruption of retrieval, then forgetting will occur. However, mnemonic devices help you remember information more easily.